good morning again. Good morning. Let's see here. 31, drifting too far from the shore. If you want to mark that in your hymnals. up here. Again, it's good to be here. Good to have everybody out. Uh, it's always a privilege for me to share God's Word with you. And certainly if you're visiting, as I said earlier, we want you to come back any chance you can get. Wow, December is here. Can you believe it? Doesn't seem like just last Sunday or Sunday before last I was talking about how the new year was coming, all the opportunity we would have throughout the, the coming new year. And so, uh, it's here upon us. Uh, we went over several things this morning. And uh, all of them are important. So certainly during this busy time that we have, that's what I wanted to start drawing our focus and our attention back to where it should be because I know it's easy to become distracted. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through season. Season. Seven, one through seven. We're going to uh, to, to look at a statement, not so much a question. This morning, the title of this morning's sermon is "Christmas Is," and I want to explore that just a little bit. And we're going to begin by reading from Luke chapter two, the first seven verses which is the beginning of the story of the birth of Christ as told by Luke. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. That's the beginning of the events of the birth of Christ, as I said, according to the Gospel of Luke. And for us as Christians, that's what Christmas is, is those first seven verses there. The celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But if you go to a Walmart or a Kroger and you took a survey of everyone that walked through, and you ask them, what is Christmas? You're going to get several different answers. And that's what I want to start off by looking at this morning is those answers. And one that may be, well, you're going to get a smart aleck that's going to say it's December the 25th, Rob. That's what Christmas is. And you have to ask yourself, really, wonder why. I've never read that in the scriptures anywhere, that the 25th of December is set aside in the Bible by the scholars that tells us what day that Christ was born on and we know that there is no definitive date and we also know that a lot of the Christmas dates and rituals that we go through are born out of pagan winter solstice celebration the 25th of December is not lacking in that department either but in any case, it's good, that, and we don't realize it maybe, but billions of people around the world recognize December the 25th as the day that the birth of Jesus Christ is. Now, whether that's an accurate date or not, I think is irrelevant. But what is relevant to that is that billions of people around the world recognize it as such. And they are acknowledging Jesus Christ being born on that day because... It seems like the society in the world that we live in is fast trying their best to not acknowledge that Christ ever existed. But on this one day, December the 25th, they celebrate his birth, whether they acknowledge his influence on us or not. 
Secondly, you may get an answer of, it's a Christmas tree. Rob? Well, again, I say it's a pagan ritual turned into Christmas tradition. And history shows us that men have tried to make real strides to associate the tree with the birth of Christ. And uh, Boniface, St. Boniface, after cutting down an oak, which was used in the Druid ritual, noted that the evergreen was more worthy of worship than this oak tree because it pointed toward heaven and was in the shape of a triangle, which signified the, the uh, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And hence, I guess that's why we have Christmas trees in our homes. And we can use those still as, the, as, a, as an object lesson, evergreen being everlasting life, just like we have our boughs of evergreen hung around. But that's certainly not what Christmas is. But to some, it is what Christmas is. The Yule log is another, coming from a pagan ritual held in the winter solstice. Supposed to be uh, a log for the fire that would burn throughout the whole ceremony, the whole celebration of that time. Though we don't necessarily burn Yule logs today, do we? We think about Yule Tide when we sing carols. That spirit of Yule, which is born directly again out of a pagan ritual. And that's what's the thing about Christmas is, is the contradiction, even unto today. And I think as we go on through this lesson, we're going to see what a contradiction the birth of Christ really is. It used to really, really bother me that I would go through these lists and, and hear these and learn more and more about how what we do for Christmas today and what it was associated with. But in the, as I get a little older, I'm beginning to see how it is kind of fitting because in the same way that Christ's birth was a contradiction at his time, its celebration is still a contradiction today. And it is a real reminder, just like the mistletoe. The mistletoe that we hang up in a doorway and hope to catch our sweetheart underneath there so we can give him a smooch is born out of a druid tradition. I'm not going to go through that because it's, it's a little gruesome. But if you're interested, look and see what mistletoe actually actually was there for or how it's born out of that Santa Claus uh, he's called by many names let's see somewhere here I've got I made a map you can google this Santa Claus in the different countries Christmas lads Father Christmas Christmas gnome Christmas man the Christ child St. Nicholas, Christmas Old Man, St. Basil, Grand Frost, and finally, Christmas Goat. That never did catch on, the Christmas Goat part, did it? Uh, those others we've, we've probably heard of. but And that's just a map of Europe. Santa Claus in the United States. St. Nicholas is another popular one. He's the guy that brings the gifts. We always try to relate that to the bringing of gifts that the wise men brought to the, to the family, to baby Jesus, to present to him. And that's a good way to do that, though it's not scriptural. It helps little kids kind of begin to learn about the story of Christmas. Stockings, that's a thing as well. St. Nick would, would uh, put fruit mainly associated with, or coal, which reminds me of one of the uh, cabins they had last night at the, at the camp, Christmas for camp. It was stocking surprise. And you went in and you picked the stocking and you either got a prize or you got a lump of coal. And they explained that to this boy, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old. They said, you go over and pick. And he said, you, you're either going to get a prize if you're a good boy or a lump of coal if you're a bad boy. And as I'm standing here, the boy turned around and walked off. <laughs> so apparently he knew that there was some coal in his future and he just rolled on out <laughs> so uh, Christmas cards being the final thing the first commercial Christmas card 1843 in England and those things have now evolved to e-cards are beginning to really take a dent out of what they would sell as traditional Christmas cards 
And all of those things that I've mentioned is what Christmas is because that's what we make Christmas. We have no one to blame but ourselves because that's what we have made Christmas. And I'm not scolding us because I partake in it just like all the other families. And my family has done it since I was a kid. And their family did it before they. And that's just what Christmas is. And that's why I was talking about that contradiction. Because what Christmas is is not what Christmas really is, is it? We know that. But yet we continue to walk that thin line this time of year as Christians to where we keep our foot firmly planted in the pagan rituals but looking with hope to what the birth of Christ really means and that hope that it gives. Just like what we'll be looking at now at what Christmas is as we focus on the rest of this Christmas is journey. Micah 5 2 says this but thou Bethlehem Ephrata though thou be little among the thousands of Judah yet all of thee out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel for whose going forth have been from old from everlasting prophecy speaking about Jesus' birth the sleepy little town of Bethlehem the centerpiece of the Christmas story we sing songs about it. We see cards with the small sleepy town and the star above it. It is what Christmas is. Any of us would recognize that. Most children would recognize that if you showed them a Christmas card with that scene. Where is this place? It's Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. And that's what Christmas is. But we have to think about something much different than we normally think about. I'd like for us to think just for a moment about the world setting when Jesus was born. Because so many times we don't think about those things. We don't think about what life was like. Roman rule was the norm. In fact, Rome ruled most of the known world at that time. Uh, a real easy way to explain that to you, what we're mostly familiar with, if the Mediterranean Sea touched it, Rome ruled it. So they were under control of a large piece of real estate at this particular time. And that, of course, is why Joseph had to take Mary to sleepy little Bethlehem. It's because that's his family history, where he was born from, to be counted and to be taxed. Now we can't imagine, but again, let me read out of Luke Something that we oftentimes just skip right over and we don't think about. I want to read this again. And it came to pass, this is chapter 2, verse 1. In those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world be taxed. Not just Judea. All of the world be taxed. Every place that Rome ruled was going to be taxed. And this same rule was that wherever you were born, whatever city that is your family heritage where they would have your records most likely, I guess, that's where you're supposed to go to pay this tax and be counted. So the world setting at this time, at the time of the birth of Christ, was upheaval, turmoil, traveling, people going places that they hadn't been in a while, going back home. I'm not being able to get back home for years because the work and the family, you know how it is. We just don't have time to get back there. Well, Caesar says you're going to go back. You're going to be taxed. And that's not so much like it is today. We just, they just didn't hop in the car or the truck or the van or whatever the case may be. You had a donkey, a horse, a cart, or feet is how you traveled. And this was short notice as well. We have to keep that in mind. And it's one thing to, to plan out a trip and to go somewhere, isn't it? But it's a little disruptive and a little stressful when someone says you have to be at such and such place on such and such day. You have no choice. That makes it a little more stressful, doesn't it? A little more difficult to get there. Those circumstances as well. We live in a world that is not so different, is it? 
and respect. When we look around and we think about the war that's going on, the political unrest, terrorism, natural disasters, all of these things have people moving, traveling for one reason or another. We have to think about that in the grand scope of things because we like to get comfortable and think that what our normal is, our normal comfortable is one thing that makes Christmas Christmas. But that's the opposite of what it was when Christ was born. It really looked a lot more like what we see today than what we have in our own mind. Also, we have to think about a national setting. When you think about Israel, and you think about that, it's not only the place that he had to go to of his birth, but this place was occupied by a foreign power. Israel was occupied by Rome. We fortunately live in a country where that's not ever happened. We realize that? Do we think about that? And then you look at the other countries, there's very few, there's very few countries throughout this world that can say that. That they've never been un occupied or under control of a foreign power. And just as a reminder, I'm going to get off target just a little bit. December the 7th comes up on Wednesday. And as Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do we recall what he called December the 7th in his speech? It was a day of, that would be an infamy. In other words, it would always be remembered generation to generation to generation. But, and again, don't take this wrong. I bet you if we walked over into our fellowship hall or any other church, Sunday school, or youth program and we asked what December the 7th was, most kids today would look at you and say, I don't have a clue. Some kids would be able to say it's the day Pearl Harbor was bombed, that World War II started. And it's just been 75 years, though it seems much longer than that. But what we don't realize and what I'm afraid that we're going to forget is the, the simple fact that if it were not for the men and women that served and protected and produced the items and things needed to protect this country's freedom, we today may be speaking German or Japanese. But our kids don't remember that. That in the lifetime of many people in this room, the world's security was threatened by people that did not share Americans religion or belief and that's what Israel was under at that time they were occupied by a ruling empire that did not understand or they didn't share the same religion they didn't share the same belief system as the as the Jew did but yet they were in control of them and to think about on a national setting how truly blessed that we are to live in a country to where we can come out on Sunday morning, walk in a comfortable building, freely worship and offer up worship to God and have no fear of being attacked, arrested, scurried away, never to be heard from again. What a true blessing that that is. But that wasn't the case at the time of Jesus' birth because they were under control of another country. We're very fortunate that we can even just walk through and say Merry Christmas to someone because our speech is not restricted. It's not a lot different now that we look at things as they really are. And then finally, the personal setting. Even with the knowledge that Joseph and Mary had about their baby, knowing who he was going to be, can you imagine the turmoil that that household went through with the decree that Caesar Augustus said that you have to go back to your town of your lineage to be counted and to be taxed? I mean, it's, the Bible tells us that Mary was great with child. And we would know that as being in the last, you know, baby's going to be born at any time. And we oftentimes don't think about these things because the Bible doesn't mention them, but humans are humans and moms have been moms and dads have been dads since they've been having babies. You know, Mary had made preparations for that baby a place. 
Joseph was a carpenter. Surely he had built him a crib. Just like you and I made preparations. When our children came along or was expecting children, we knew where we was gonna, the baby was going to sleep and, and here's the clothes or whatever that they had at that time. Here's what he's going to have. We're going to wrap him in. All that was turned upside down for them. Suddenly the thing that they had planned on, the things that they had hoped for, the things that were so normal and so comfortable for them was turned upside down because of a decree. I decree that you will be in Bethlehem instead of at home where you're comfortable and prepared. And so they're whisked away. Their whole world was turned upside down with that decree. But Jesus still came. And as far as I know, that crib that I mentioned, Jesus never slept in because if we think about it, he, the Bible tells us he was laid in the manger because there was no room for him in the inn. And then he was swept away to Egypt because of the threat from Herod. And when he came back, he was older, bigger than what would have slept in a crib. So all of those plans that they made, as young couples do with the birth of their first child, even with the knowledge of it was that was the son of God and his name would be Jesus, they still surely made those preparations. All of those was thrown to the side. How many of us, and don't raise your hand because I know everyone here would raise your hand. How many times have you had plans made? Plans laid. This is what we're going to do. This is how it's going to be. And then suddenly, because of something beyond your control, those plans were done. They were gone. You were not going to do what you had planned on doing. Not so different, is it? And we see that God provided for Mary and Joseph and Jesus just like he will provide for us as well. So when we look at Christmas and as we begin this Christmas holiday, we can say this. Christmas, Christmas, the day that we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will come. It will come. December the 25th, save that Jesus returns, is sent back to take away his church. December the 25th will come. Despite the tragedy for those folks down in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and out in Oakland, California, and no doubt the other tragedies that we'll hear between now and then. There's going to be people across this world that are going to be in upheaval because of things beyond their control. There's still going to be refugees from Syria trying to flee that awful war that has been raging and the indiscriminate killing of women and children. Christmas is still going to come. People are going to be dissatisfied with the election results here in the United States until the next election. Christmas is going to come because it's the most important event that's ever happened to mankind is the birth of Jesus Christ as our Savior and that overshadows all of the human misery that has ever been and that will ever will be Christmas is something to be celebrated Christmas is many things and how we observe it is different oftentimes. But regardless of where we are and what our situation is, Christmas will always be about a new mom and dad, someplace that they hadn't planned on being, holding the Savior of the world, who was sent for our benefit. That's what Christmas is. And let us strive to make sure that we pass that along as Christians. Let us strive to be concentrated on those points, that the fact that we have a Savior, we have a God that loves us enough to send a Savior so that there may be a plan of salvation, that we who did not deserve grace are freely given grace. And I ask you this morning, have you accepted Jesus Christ as that gift of grace? Is he your personal savior? And if he isn't, I ask you, why not today? Why have you not accepted him? Hearing the word and believing 
is required. And once you hear and believe, you must confess that he is Lord and Savior of your life and repent of the sin that has separated you from God. And then be willing to be buried with him in baptism, the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection. And when you're raised, you're raised that new creation in him. And you walk and serve faithfully until Christ returns or until we're called away in death. Now maybe you've taken those steps. Maybe you are washed and covered by the blood of Christ, but you realize, you know what? I've been getting wrapped up, been too distracted in things that are not really that important, and I need to refocus myself on serving the Lord as best as he has equipped me. I encourage you to do that. Rededicate yourself to his service. In either case, if you have a decision to make this morning, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. Number 31, Drifting Too Far From The Shore. I encourage you as we sing, if you have a decision, would you come? We're going to sing.